Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In the last couple of lessons, we thoroughly investigated the sample data source.cs, and it contained classes that the XAML page elements ultimately bound to. Uh, the biggest task was learning how the sample data item and the sample data group objects were related together and what made them similar, what made them different. And then we saw where a bunch of hard-coded instances of each of them were created so that our grid app project had data to display whenever it was run and then also whenever we just saw it in the design time experience like we looked at in the previous lesson. So where we are again is lab number one, exercise number two, where we're going to load the recipe data and we're just going to perform all of these tasks in this lesson. And now ideally again we would be writing this this code by hand ourselves uh, instead of just copying in the code that somebody at Microsoft created for us. Uh, but honestly, I went down that path. It was a little boring, like I said earlier. And so uh, I'm sure you don't want to watch me type and mistype code for 45 minutes. Still, we really wanted to understand how this works. So we spent some time in the sample data source understanding what it did. And we're going to continue to look through the recipe data source and see how it's constructed and what insights we can glean by picking it apart and really trying to understand how it operates. So we'll do that after this lesson. But for now, we're just going to perform all of these tasks in exercise number two. So let's go ahead and start. The first thing we want to do is to add in the recipe data source from the starting materials. So let's open up Visual Studio, have it shut down here for some reason. Let's get back into Contoso Cookbook. All right, and what it wants us to do is add an existing item to this data model folder. So we're going to right click, add existing item. And there's a couple of places where we can find this either on our our C drive where we have the Win8 CS folder, the Camp in a Box folder, and we can go into Labs, Assets, and I believe we can find it here. Yeah, there's recipe data source.cs. Or if you downloaded the code that was associated with this series of lessons, I also placed it in there, if you recall in the very first lesson. So let's go to the desktop and you can find the file in the WinStore app dev cs or wherever you unzip this file to on your local hard drive. And in the resources folder, we can find it in that same data subfolder and then ultimately the recipe data source.cs. We're gonna click the add. Okay, so let's open it up and see what we got. Whoops, open up the recipe data source. All right, has a lot of good comments in it at the top. And so uh, we could learn a little bit more about this and we should a little bit later. I'm just gonna kind of roll this up for now. Take a look at a high level. Huh, you can see that it has four classes. Let's come back to that because they look an awful lot like the classes that we saw when we looked at the sample data source. Here we have a recipe data group, a recipe data item, a recipe data common, and then we have this recipe data source. So that's interesting, and that should give us some confidence that we already know what's kind of going on here, right? Let's continue on. All right, the next thing that we're asked to do is open up the grouped items page, and then ultimately we'll be doing it for all of the code behinds. And we're going to change all the references from sample data source to recipe data source, sample data group to recipe data group, sample data item to recipe data item. All right, so let's take some time and do that. We'll start with the grouped items page. And so we're going to change this from sample data source to recipe data source. Hey, and it found it because it highlighted the syntax. So we're good to go there and change uh, let's see, sample data group to recipe data group. Cool. Let's see if it has any more. Here's sample data item, recipe data item. Whoops, I spelled it wrong. There we go. Now I might be missing one, but I'll bet you it'll pop up here before long. So that's good. Let's go on to the next file, which would be the group detail page, .xaml.cs. Let's look through it here. Sample data source, that becomes recipe data source. All right, and hey, we haven't looked in this file yet. Notice how it has a default view model with two keys. It has a key for group and a key for items. Cool, that's what we talked about earlier. And then here's another sample data item. Let's make that a recipe 
data item if I can spell it. And just combing back through here really quick, okay. And then finally we want to look at the item detail page.xaml. Comb through it real quick. All right, so here we go. Let's change sample data source to recipe data source. And then sample data item, let's change that to recipe data item. And hopefully that'll be it. I may have missed one, but we'll find it. We'll find it eventually. I could do a search and just a uh, control F and you'll notice it gives me this little window. So maybe that would be a good approach here. Let's just look for sample and to see all the spots where the word sample is used. And this is in the current document. Let's make it for the entire or all open documents. That would be good. And then let's close the, the, the ones that we know where it'll find things we don't want. All right, so we just have three open documents. So now we're only gonna search for the word sample in all open documents. And those are all code comments. Uh, this is used as an identifier sample data groups, but it's just a variable name. It's still pulling from recipe data source. So I think we're good there. Let's continue on. And that's it. Okay, so we're good. I think we're good to go there. Let's go ahead and save this and look at what the rest of the instructions say. All right, the next thing we're called to do is task two, load the recipe data. And it wants us to create a new folder called data. And then we're going to add an existing item, recipes.txt, into that folder. All right, so let's start by right-clicking on the project name, which is below the solution, and selecting add new folder. We're going to call this data. And then we're going to right-click on the new data folder and select add existing item. And then we're going to look for this recipes.txt file, which I'm pulling from my own little resources cache, but you could pull it also from uh, from the uh, the camp in a box, Windows 8 camp in a box, and, and find the same file. Click add, and so now we have a recipes.txt, and I'm tempted to talk about what this file format is, but we're going to devote an entire video to it, so let's just ignore it for now. Let's just be satisfied with the fact that it's in our project and we're following these steps blindly for the moment. All right. Now let's see what else we're supposed to do. Oh yes, we need to add a folder name images to the project and then we're going to copy all of these folders, tiles, Chinese, French, German, Indian, Italian, and Mexican, along with their contents from the images folder of the starting materials. All right, we can do that. So we're going to right click and add new folder. We're going to call this images. All right, and then inside of that images folder, we want to add the images that we have from the starting materials. Now, the instructions tell us that the easiest way to go about this is to find all of the files you want to use. In this case, I'm going to navigate into the resources, files, there we go. And I'm going to drag all of these subfolders that it, that it listed in the instructions. I'm just going to drag them and drop them into the images folder in the solution explorer. And it not only imports those subfolders, but it also imports all of the images. Sweet. And as I hover my mouse cursor over, I can see that those indeed look like images that we would want. All right. So let's continue looking through this. Oh, yeah. Then we need to make some changes in the app.xaml because we want to load the recipe data source, load the data from the file into memory. And so that's what's going on here. And so we're going to want to, first of all, let's go to our app.xaml, which we said was the starting point for our application. And then it says we want to uh, drill down and look for this, this check to see the previous execution state. I think that was the instruction, right? In the on launch event handler, add an async call to load the recipes using the recipe data source .load data async function. Do it after the if statement that checks the previous execution state. So here's that if statement. So I would expect to put it right there. So let's, I'm not above copying code. Let's go ahead and click this copy code here. And then let's hit control V on our keyboard and paste it in. All right, and so I can see that the name recipe data source does not exist in the current context. That's because we skipped a step here. We didn't add this using Contoso cookbook.data. And if we were to look at our 
recipe data source, notice that its namespace is Contoso Cookbook.data. So that's why we're missing that namespace, uh, namespace reference. Now I could go ahead and at the very top of this file type in using uh, Contoso Cookbook.data, but you know the shortcut for this, right? Remember, there's that little blue line that appears under the R in recipe data source, and if I were to hover my mouse cursor and then click the down arrow, I can just click add Contoso using Contoso Cookbook Data and it will add it for me and now it recognizes that class name and we see it added the using statement added at the very top of our of our file okay great now as i look at this it looks like we're doing the same line of code twice here so i'm going to delete this previous code that was already in here and we're going to leave it like that okay let's look and see if we have any other instructions here all right, I guess the only other thing we need to do is cross our fingers and hope that it works. So let's run it in the simulator and see what happens. Aha, now we're getting somewhere. Look at those beautiful recipes showing up in our app. Yes, so we have some success here. Let's get over to the right-hand side. Yep, that looks great. Let's dive into one of these take a look at it all right well not exactly the experience that we would anticipate but I have a feeling if we continue to follow the steps we're gonna be modifying these templates so we're good there and then let's click on one of the individual uh, uh, group headers and okay still again not the experience we would expect it's missing some of the data missing some of the data but we're gonna to get to all that soon but we've got a working application here and that makes me happy okay so what just happened well, I think at the outset, before we dive in or as we dive in to understand the differences between the sample data source and the new recipe data source, I think it would be helpful to show the differences visually. So let's put that, let's close down that and let's get rid of that for now. And what I wanna do is go into um, the folder for this lesson and I've added a PDF file it's the uh, what I'm calling the Contoso Cookbook class diagram. And uh, if you look, this is what I would say the class diagram is for our sample data source.cs. Now, what is a class diagram? Is this the first time you've seen this kind of notation? Well, it's basically a part of a set of notation called UML, short for the Unified Modeling Language. Uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about class diagrams in UML. But just know that uh, it's just a way of expressing a design at a very high level, at least in the way that we've used it. And um, there are really three parts to a class diagram that you need to understand, and it's really intuitive. Uh, each box represents a class, and each box has three compartments. You have the name of the class at the very top compartment, then you see its properties and methods in the next two compartments below it. If it's public, typically the name will be capitalized, and sometimes there'll be a plus symbol next to it. And additionally, sometimes you'll be able to see the data types of each member in this, in this uh, class, whether it's the, the data type for a property or the return value for a given um, method uh, or, and or the, uh, the input parameters for the given method as well. Now, you can see that in my case, I'm leaving out a lot of detail in this class diagram. And I did that on purpose so as to not confuse the, the key idea I wanna get across here. But we can see each class is designed at a high level and quickly see the relationships between the classes. Well, what relationships? The relationships are denoted by lines as well as what either comes at the beginning of the line or the end of the line. Now, you can see that in most cases here, we have a line that begins or at one end has this empty arrowhead and that denotes inheritance. Specifically, we can see that the recipe data common is a, or has a relationship to this bindable base. It implements or derives or inherits from bindable base. Also, we can see that you have the sample data group and the sample data item and they are a instance of or they inherit or they implement the sample data common so there's an is a 
relationship. Sample data group really is a sample data common, as well as sample data item is really a sample data common, okay? Furthermore, we can see that there's a relationship between the sample data group and the sample data item. In this case, we don't see any arrowheads, but we do see a number one on the left side and an asterisk on the right side, and the name for that is cardinality. It means specifically that one instance of a sample data group has a reference to potentially many instances of sample data item. And so, you know, these are observations that we've made before about the relationship between these two classes. And we've seen them as we've populated the sample data source uh, in the constructor when it would create a group and then add a series of, of sample data item instances to that group, okay? All right, so now compare what you see here in this hierarchy, this structure, just kind of blur your eyes a little bit, and then look at this. This is the new recipe data source. It's almost identical. Yeah, there's some details that are different, but overall we have the recipe data common, and it is a bindable base. It inherits from bindable base. Recipe data group and recipe data item are both a recipe data common. They both inherit from recipe data common. And recipe data group, for each recipe data group, it has one or more recipe data items associated with it. All right, so again, sure, the properties and the methods that are defined inside each of the classes are a little bit different, but the overall structure is exactly the same, and the relationships and the roles and the responsibilities that have been delegated to each class are essentially the same with a few implementation differences here and there. Okay. So let's stop right there for now. In this lesson, we made some significant changes to our app and saw dramatic changes to the output. And to better understand it, we looked at a class diagram, a UML class diagram, to show us the overall, the 50,000 foot bird's eye, uh, bird's view uh, look at the design and the structure of the class hierarchy and how closely the sample data source and the recipe data source resemble each other. So in the next lesson, we're gonna to start to pick apart the recipe data source, and uh, we're gonna to try to leave no stone unturned. So we're gonna look at just about every line of code, hopefully, in the recipe data source. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.